Chinese people say if you live on a mountain, you live off the mountain. And if you live by the sea, you live off the sea. This is a strategy for survival. Chinese people make the best use of every inch of soil, and their great knowledge of food is evident everywhere. No matter where Chinese people live, from fertile valleys to desolate frozen highlands to modern cities, as long as there's a patch of green, they live in harmony with nature. Yinxiao and Huang Lanrong are members of the Zhuang ethnic group who live in the small mountain village of Xiaoyao in Guizhou province. The tree branches they have collected smell very fresh. Their rather ordinary looking leaves are needed for a coming festival. For the Miao, Dong and Zhuang people in Tongjiang County, Guizhou, Sticky rice has long been a staple in their diet. Nearly a hundred primitive species of sticky rice grow on the terraced fields around these scattered mountain villages. Both Pan Yin Chao and Huang Lan Rong can speak Mandarin and are middle school graduates but they've never been outside of their home county. Like the other villagers, they know how to make good use of the maple leaves from the nearby mountains. October is the harvest season for sticky rice, and the Zhuang people of Xiaoyao village have a special harvest festival. There are two kinds of rice, sticky and non-sticky. Sticky rice becomes glutinous and elastic after cooking because it contains amylopectin. Pan and Huang are boiling the leaves they collected. <laughs> the leaves soon release a yellow-green liquid, which is used to add colour to the sticky rice. After sticky rice is soaked and boiled, it becomes dark in colour. These women are colouring the rice yellow using an extract from another local plant. Using plant extracts to colour food is an ancient practice. People living in remote locations especially enjoy colouring their food in ways that are natural. Sticky rice contains a lot of oil, so it staves off hunger longer. It is thus the logical choice for a staple food. Wang Xiaojung, who was 58 this year, grew up eating sticky rice in a place called Jia Che, a Miao village not far from Xiaoyao. In the 1960s, the local government promulgated a high-yield, non-glutinous rice species that younger people began consuming. But Wang Xiaojung believes that only sticky rice can build strong muscles. <laughs> it's impractical to use machinery on terraced fields, so locals still use crude knives to harvest their crops. 
Growing rice is more painstaking in the steep and barren mountains than in other locations, but Wang Xiaojiang's ancestors found a way to grow rice on this formidable terrain by hand. During the Qin and Han dynasties, the cultivation area of sticky rice was expanded, and the rice paddies grew more than just rice. Over 1,000 years ago, Wang Xiaojiang's ancestors made a significant discovery. They discovered that paddy fields are also ideal for raising fish and ducks. And moreover, the fish and ducks keep insects under control and their excrement fertilizes the soil. Even today, chemical fertilizer and pesticide use is rare here. Though high in quality, sticky rice only produces 50% of the yield of non-glutinous rice per unit of area. Only 5% of the area devoted to rice in China is used for growing glutinous rice. But people in the mountains still prefer it. How can they live without this treasure? With its rich past, sticky rice will continue to hold a valued position on Chinese dinner tables. <laughs> Many young villagers, however, have left for the city, and less and less area is being set aside to grow sticky rice. People are abandoning traditional agricultural methods. The staple food for the new rice festival is ready. Ban and Huang are working on a main dish of pickled fish. Tongjiang is humid year-round, so the fish must be preserved quickly after they're caught. The locals believe that spicy foods have health benefits according to traditional Chinese medicine. Fish and sour soup with litsi and ginger is popular with the Zhuang people. The county banquet is beginning. brand of liquor brewed from sticky rice is a popular alcoholic beverage. Ban Yin Zhao has been aging this crock in her cellar for seven years. <laughs> the street banquet brings the people together in a spirit of sharing and it is catching the world's attention as a part of China's intangible cultural heritage. People living in the barren mountains have used their skills to create a gourmet cuisine. The skills required to make a living from the ocean, however, are very different. Today is young Wang Defeng's first day as a professional diver. Wang Shuhui is going to guide him. 
The heavy diving gear is designed to protect the diver from the frigid water and the pressure. Wang Shuhui, though still quite young, already has 15 years of diving experience. They are searching for a precious ocean commodity. This sea cucumber is fast asleep, but its peaceful summer nap will soon end. Jiangzi, a small island in the northern Yellow Sea, is famous for a variety of seafood. Among them are many delicacies favoured by the Chinese people, such as sea cucumbers, abalone, and sea urchins, which account for most of the catch. The clean water and ocean rapids here provide a perfect environment for them. The underwater scenery is splendid, but Wang De Feng is too nervous about being 30 meters below the surface to enjoy it. Sea cucumbers have been around for 600 million years. The Spanish and the Chinese have been eating sea cucumbers for at least 2,000 years. The sea cucumbers that the two divers are collecting today were released into this water as baby sea cucumbers three years ago. Baby abalones, scallops and sea urchins are also released for later harvest. This 2,000 kilometer stretch of water is the largest sea farm in China and Asia. People here have discovered a way to balance human society and nature by raising fish in an eco-friendly way. Seafood is the main protein source for half of the Chinese population. One popular Shandong seafood dish is braised sea cucumber with scallions. Shandong is famous for its quality scallions, which are essential for this dish. Cooking makes the protein-rich sea cucumber tender and soft and releases a tantalizing aroma from the scallions. Another well-known and expensive seafood item is abalone, which entered the Chinese diet much later than sea cucumbers. This industry is motivated by huge profits. People can be seen harvesting seafood at dawn every day. Different style boats are used in different locations. Here, the ocean currents are swift. Working in a hostile environment can be profitable, but it's far from easy. Abalones are often found on algae-covered rocks in the rapid currents. The abalone lives in the crevices of the rocks, making it difficult to reach. Their large feet enable them to hold on to the rocks with a force of up to 200 kilograms. 
canvas makes it possible for them to resist the violent waves and currents. Fishing for them is difficult. As the two divers continue to work underwater, diners are already eating their earlier catch. Because it's only the start of the season for one particular species, it's not among their catch. Wang Hoshi is 45, and he's on the last dive of his career. Wang Hoshi dives wearing a lead helmet and weighted shoes. The total added weight of over 50 kilos enables him to go 40 meters below the surface. Sea urchins have only been part of the Chinese diet for 30 years. They were introduced through Japanese cuisine, which has become popular in China. The most popular way to eat sea urchins is raw. The yellow part is best, but it only appears between June and August. This dive is Wang Hoshi's last. This is because the retirement age for deep sea divers in China is 45. After he retires, Wang Defeng will be on his own. During their six hour day, Wang Defeng and Wang Shuhui make many dives. <laughs> The divers are exhausted. This is Wang Defeng's first day as a diver. He throws the smaller scallops back into the sea to continue growing. Harvesting seafood is difficult. The people on Jiangzi Island go out to sea. The people living by Lake Tai wait for the river crabs to come to them. In October, when the northwest wind rises and the moon is bright, small river crabs come up from the river on their way to breed in the sea. Guided by instinct, they never get lost. These crabs come from a fish farm. This crab arrived at the farm seven months ago when it was the size of a button, but now it's fully grown. A few days ago, this crab molted for the 19th time. It is its last and most important molting since it is now truly an adult crab. Crabs have been eaten in China for 4,000 years. 
Chinese people prefer to simply steam crabs to prepare them for the table. Steaming is the best way to preserve the taste of the crab. The best part is inside the shell, but it takes skills and patience to enjoy it, and few people today are so skillful. Crabs have long graced Chinese dinner tables, but few people today will ever have the chance to enjoy wild crabs. The scientific name for these river crabs is Eriochia sinensis. During their breeding season, long lines of crabs used to emerge from rivers or inland lakes on their way to the sea. But today, ecological degradation has drastically reduced their numbers. These small crabs have been artificially bred in a breeding pond with water from Lake Tai. These crabs feed on water weeds, small shrimp, and fish. They will grow slower and stronger than those given artificial feed. Although they all come from the same pond, the price of the crabs varies with weight. A 100 gram crab may sell for 25 yuan, but a 350 gram crab costs 20 times as much. Each of these weighs over 350 grams. <laughs> the crab season is only two months long. River crabs are a luxury that only a small number of people can afford. But due to the great demand for crabs, a so-called crab dish has been created that actually contains no crabs at all. The chef is beginning to work his magic. A simple combination of ordinary ingredients surprisingly produces a dish that tastes very much like crab. The use of common ingredients to achieve this unexpected result is a fascinating Chinese skill. The name of this dish is boldly called tastier than real crabs. Breeding crabs is a highly profitable business. A small area in a river or lake may be home to 100 wild crabs, but the same area of fish farm can support at least 600. On the other hand, the crowded conditions mean there is less food and oxygen for each crab. The crabs in this fish farm need the water weeds from Lake Tai to keep the water clean, and the weeds provide an ideal food for the crabs. Famous Jingjiang-style steamed dumplings filled with minced crab meat and crab yellow have been popular for more than 100 years. There can be as many as 32 pleats on the dumpling holding the crab meat. The steam thoroughly cooks the filling inside the thin skin of the dumpling. Though the dumpling skin is paper thin, it is nevertheless very strong. The secret of its strength is known only to the best cooks. Eating these dumplings can be just as much of a challenge as preparing them.
Most crabs are consumed by city people, and the people of Shanghai have the biggest appetite for crabs. Shanghai is located where the Yangtze River flows into the ocean, and this is the place where the wild crabs used to breed and begin their lives. Though Shanghai people are generally very thrifty, they won't hesitate when it comes to crabs. Shanghai people know exactly the best time of the year to eat the crabs, which is different for male and female crabs. Chongming Island, 50 kilometers north of Shanghai, is the natural home of crabs. It is the largest alluvial island in the world and part of the Yangtze River Delta. It has been a significant source of food in China for a thousand years and today it enjoys the fastest economic growth in the whole of China. But in Xinhua, Jiangsu, at the northern tip of the delta, urbanization is lagging. It is noon in the summer, and Xia Juntai and Wang Yuanfeng row their boat onto a lake. They are coming to water a huge crop they're growing in this unique field. Getting the best agricultural yields in this densely populated plain in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze is a challenge. This type of field is a fine example of the creativity of Xinhua people. A thousand years ago, this was a swampy, desolate shore prone to flooding. To prevent the floods, people piled up mud this swamp was formed when the water receded, creating this special agricultural field. Taro is the main crop here, and conditions in this type of field are ideal for growing it. However, watering this giant plant is difficult. The stems and leaves grow as high as a man. The long-handled ladle he uses to water the taro is a local creation. Mr. Xia comes here four times a day and spends an hour each time to ensure that the taro get enough water. Mr. Xia is 49 this year. Both of his sons work in the city, so his wife is his only helper. During the growing season, they are very busy. So busy, they eat their lunch in the field. Fortunately, the lake has many wild fish in it, and this makes it convenient for a picnic. The taro also needs to be fertilized. Mud mixed with weeds makes a great organic fertilizer. The taro is their baby, and they provide it with loving parental care. The harvest time for the taro is autumn. <laughs> the edible part of the taro is the corn, which is nutritious and stores well. Taro has been a popular crop in the southern Yangtze River Basin for about 2,000 years. This variety of taro, which has a smooth surface, is Xia Juntai's favorite. 
Dragon Fragrance Taro is like an elegant lady from a respectable family. It's a favorite of the people of Xinhua. Long ago, when the food supply was unstable, taro made for a perfect substitute for rice. When the taro is ready for harvest, wild river crabs also reach maturity. Today's Huayang style cuisine still features tofu with crab yellow, a time-honored local dish. The crab yellow releases a special fragrance when placed in the boiling broth. Tofu and taro pick up the taste of the crab. Mr. Shah's favorite, however, is braised pork and brown sauce with taro. The cooked pork has a tempting aroma, and the taro absorbs a great deal of the grease from the pork. Taro is always on the menu in Xinhua during the holidays. In the economically developed areas of China, Xia Juntai is probably the last farmer working on family fields, passed down for generations. <laughs> This doesn't bother him. Nothing can stop him from enjoying his special field and his home. <laughs> Xinhua people are amply rewarded for wisely making best use of local conditions. The annual harvest on this high plateau is an event well worth celebrating. The morning air on this plateau is chilly even in August. On this important day, Sangye is up early while her family is still fast asleep. She is the most capable person in the family. In two days, this barley will become liquor. The day begins with hope. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau, known as the Roof of the World, is where the Yalung Sangpo River leaves the mountains to rush into Shigazu, located in a valley in southern Tibet. Thanks to the river, it is the most developed agricultural area in Tibet. Local barley has long been a staple food of Tibetans, allowing people to survive this hostile environment. Now that the barley in the pot has absorbed enough water, it is ready for the next very important step. If the barley gets too hot, the liquor will be bitter, but Sang Ye carefully controls the temperature. The barley will soon be ready for harvest. It is its strong resistance to cold that enables it to grow on this desolate plateau. The low air pressure at this altitude makes cooking things difficult because of the low boiling temperature. The barley has to be fried before further processing. Zanba is often eaten with roasted barley flour, buttered tea, and big chunks of butter or milk residue. To survive on the plateau, people need foods that are calorie rich. Like people who live near the North and South Pole, they require larger amounts of food than most people. An individual ear of barley here could mean the difference between life and death.
The festival held before the barley harvest is the biggest holiday of the year. Walking around in the field is an essential activity for the most important member of each family. Sanye is the one chosen from her family. This ceremony has a thousand years of history in Shigazu. Through it, people express their thanks and great respect for Mother Nature. Fingerprints made with barley flour have spiritual significance. The people believe that their prayers will be heard in heaven. The celebration continues for a week, during which every family erects a colourful tent. In Sun Ye's home, the liquor is now ready. <laughs> Many people praise Sun Ye's barley liquor. <laughs> Tibetan food, like other things on the plateau, is simple and natural. But Tibetan cuisine can even be found in big cities thousands of kilometers away. All the ingredients of Tibetan food are natural, but there are many possible combinations. For people outside of Tibet, Everything on the plateau seems mysterious and fascinating. Harvest season begins in autumn, coming two months later than in most places in China. It's also the rainy season. Neighbors all help each other with the harvest so that they can finish cutting and sun drying as fast as possible. Bundles of the barley stand in the fields against the backdrop of the snowy Himalayas. These people are probably closer to heaven than anyone else in the world. They wonder how people in the big cities can stay in touch with Mother Nature. Zhang Guichun is a native of Beijing. Rather than going for a stroll with a birdcage or doing Tai Chi like many others in the city, this spring morning, he is up on his roof. Five months from now, the seeds he has planted here will bring about a small miracle high in the air. Beijing is the biggest city in northern China and home to over 20 million people. Over the past 800 years, it has served as the capital city for several dynasties. Today, it's a major world city. In addition to the many skyscrapers, Beijing has the Forbidden City and other reminders of the past. Zhang Weichun lives in a small lane known as a hutong. He 
has always wanted a garden. But land is in short supply in Beijing, so he's set up a garden on his roof. The seeds are still asleep in the soil, and the fish pool still has ice in it from last year. But with the arrival of summer, the scene on the roof quickly changes. Lodiarma, most people buy their produce in a supermarket, but Zhang Guichun is like a satisfied farmer getting his produce from his own field. His tomatoes remind people of how good tomatoes used to taste many years ago. Zhang Guichun is also a creative cook, and using squash flowers is one of his specialties. He only uses ordinary but fresh and healthy ingredients. Most roofs in the city are bare, but Zhang Guichun's is bustling with life. Today, this roof is an ideal habitat. From the first day he worked on his little garden, however, Zhang Guichun faced many challenges. For example, on hot days, moisture in the soil, just 15 centimetres thick, quickly evaporated. But John decided to try anyway. He couldn't just stand by while his plants withered. While most of the city is suffering from the heat, Zhang's home is cool and pleasant. Every leaf in his small but luxuriant garden helps purify the air. It's like a gift from Zhang Guichun to the city.
It's nearing the end of summer, and Zhang has invited his neighbors to come and enjoy dumplings. The filling for the dumplings is made with squash from his own garden. The weather begins to cool in late summer, and this is when Chinese people enjoy dumplings, particularly in northern China. This custom in Beijing is called putting on autumn weight. People believe that dumplings stuffed with vegetables and meat give them energy. Okay, let's eat two dumplings, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.